Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the, t the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Cuccio, and I'm here today with a new co-host, Joseph Schweitzer, who um, I'm sure lots of you will recognize uh, as a familiar face in the uh, in the Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, Joseph, uh, thanks for coming on and co-hosting this one with me. It's actually quite fitting since we're talking with Tim Beko, who co coordinates all of Ethereum's core developer meetings and works at the Ethereum Foundation on the protocol support team. Um, and today we're talking about, uh, well, all things Ethereum merge, uh, which is quite timely because uh, there was just a, a major uh, testnet merge uh, right like a few minutes before we started this. So, um, you know, this will go out. You know, fairly fairly soon after after that happens, so this is actually quite timely. But um, yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for co-hosting this one, Joseph, and maybe tell the listeners a little bit by yourself and what makes you a, a competent co-host on this particular topic. Well, if I'm going to uh, jump in on one, I feel like this is an appropriate subject. Um, I've been around the Ethereum space for a while. I do communications and PR work uh, with most of my time at uh, Ethereum Foundation as well. But I'm sort of a general tinkerer, so anything in the uh, layer one uh, sort of blockchain space that uh, passes the legitimacy sniff test is something that I've liked to play with for a while and um, just happy to jump in. Cool. Well, yeah, happy to have you on. And hopefully you can come on for, you know, most of our, uh, you know, Ethereum focused episodes, because I think you have a lot of like insider information and uh, really good insights. So. Um, glad to have you here. And the wonderful thing about public systems is that nobody has insider information if you're paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, Tim, thanks for thanks for joining us today. Um, uh, right, right after the uh, the merge. Um, on Sepolia. Welcome on Sepolia. Yeah, yeah. Sepolia <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Cool. So before we talk to Tim, I just want to tell you about our sponsors this week. Uh, securing blockchains and earning rewards needs doesn't need to be energy intensive or complicated. And by staking your assets with Chorus One, you contribute to network security and earn rewards too. Chorus One has been a pioneer in this space since 2018, and they secure hundreds of millions of dollars in assets on over 30 decentralized networks, including Solana, Cosmos, Ethereum, and many others. If you're an institution and you want to run your own node, you can use Chorus One's white label service and their battle-proven infrastructure to participate in proof-of-stake networks in an easy way. So head over to Chorus.One and start your staking journey. We're also uh, supported by Paraswap. Paraswap is a multi-chain DEX aggregator. This means that through Paraswap, you can easily access the liquidity of various different decentralized exchanges. The protocol automatically finds the cheapest liquidity for you so you can know that you are getting the best price for your trade. Paraswap is also gas friendly and helping you keep your transactions low. They recently added support for Avalanche, Polygon, BSC, and Phantom. And you can also use Paraswap directly in your Ledger Live app if you use a Ledger. In addition to that, they are also becoming a DAO. So if you have PSP tokens, that's something you can participate in, as in participate in the governance of the protocol. And the Paraswap DAO just voted the gas refund program, uh, which will allow Paraswap stakers to get up to 100% of gas uh, refunds on their trades on top of their auto compounding yield. So to learn more, visit paraswap.io. And since we're here, I also want to mention something uh, that um, I think a lot of people perhaps have already noticed. I'm organizing a conference in Paris on July 22nd. It's called Nebular Summit. It's happening on the day after ECC, so during ECC week, which is one of the largest Ethereum developer conferences in Europe, actually one of the largest blockchain developer conferences in Europe as well. Uh, Nebular Summit is all about celebrating the Cosmos and Interchain ecosystem. So I hope to bring a lot of you know Cosmos folks and uh, Ethereum folks together for this conference. Um, we'll be joined by Cosmos developers, researchers, and entrepreneurs as they discuss the challenges facing the interchain and you know, talking about the future of the internet of blockchains. So tickets are almost sold out as we speak right now. Uh, we're going to be pulling the plug on the ticket sale soon, but you might be able to squeeze in. Uh, check out nebular.paris for more information. And I do want to mention our sponsors who are making this possible. Evmos, Anoma, Club, Neutron, Agoric, and Celestia. So with that, let's uh, let's get into this. Um, Tim, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got involved um, in this work. Yeah, well, I guess, yeah, first, thanks for, for having me on. 
Yeah, my background. Uh, so I, <laughs> I, I started like getting interested in blockchains around 2013, 2014. Uh, first year, first heard about uh, Bitcoin and um, got in, into that. Uh, then a couple of years later, I actually heard about Ethereum through the DAO. Uh, but when the DAO was like a project um, and uh, not a hack. Uh, so I, I like heard mentions of it before, but the, the DAO project is really what got me to like actually try out Ethereum. So I literally bought Ether and bought DAO tokens like the week or even maybe day before it got hacked. Um, and uh, and then the next morning, like remember reading on Reddit, the post about some, uh, I think it was like say saying, I think someone is draining the DAO. Um, and that was like a pretty eventful couple of weeks after that, because not only was there this big hack, but after there was like the Ethereum Classic split um, and you had to figure out like how to split your tokens uh, in order to prevent replay attacks. And and I knew like absolutely nothing about blockchains then. So I was just like copy pasting random commands in my terminal, hoping that I wouldn't just lose all my coins doing so. So it was, it was, it was like a really interesting, uh, I guess, way to, to get into the space. Um, but after the DAO, there was like this this lull where it felt like, you know, maybe Ethereum uh, was not going to be like a successful experiment because, well, if this is a smart contract platform and you can't write a smart contract on it without it getting hacked, um, you know, is there is there a ton of value there? So I get, I get following a bit, uh, but then in, in like late 2016, early 2017, you start to see a bunch of projects uh, use Ethereum again. And obviously in like, by mid late 2017, there was this huge ICO boom, um, and there I kind of realized like there would probably be a lot of demand for Ethereum, even if like all the applications in 2017 turned out not to work. Uh, clearly, you know, there's a lot of things you you could do with, with with a blockchain like that. And I decided I wanted to work like at the protocol layer because as a user, like it was still pretty rough to use Ethereum in those days, and um, you know, like when there were like ICOs and the, the mempool would stay congested for like hours to days. It was just like a really bad experience and it felt like there's a lot you could improve there. But I wasn't like an engineer or researcher. I was like a product manager. So it took me a while to find like a product manager job working on the protocol and not on the product built on top of the protocol. Uh, so it took, it took like about a year, but then uh, consensus put together a protocol team and uh, I joined that. And uh, so I worked. I worked as part of Consensus for about two and a half years on their uh, Hyperledger Base U uh, client. Uh, so got involved in, in basically mainnet protocol work through that. Um, and as part of that, uh, you know, I worked a lot with, with folks like Hudson, uh, who was chairing the Awkward Devs calls at the time. And um, and then around like uh, 2020, he wanted to move on to other things. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I decided to step up and, and take the role there. And so since then I've been basically coordinating, uh, these developer calls that we have, uh, on Ethereum where the different, uh, protocol implement implementation teams get together and, and chat about, uh, changes to Ethereum. Um, yeah, so that's how, how I ended up here. Gotcha. And before we dig into core development and, uh, uh sort of how governance and ACD calls, all core dev calls work in general. What's your role today? Um, we mentioned earlier you were with uh, Ethereum Foundation um, on the, the protocol support side. What is protocol support? Can you uh, just let the folks know? Yeah, yeah. So uh, our team, it's not really well known, but the, the team I'm on at the EF is called protocol support. And it's a bit of an odd team because like before me, there was no team. It was just like Hudson, you know, like floating in the org chart. Um, and then like since Ethereum has like grown and, and, and gotten more complex uh, in the past couple of years, like there basically there was just like a team put together. And, um, you know, there's folks like Danny and me where we uh, obviously share these calls. Uh, there's a bunch of folks who help. Uh, either like get better input and share updates with the community like Trent. Uh, we just have folks who work on like, you know, specific stuff behind the scenes. Um, like there was the Sepolia merge today and someone on our team is just working on getting the hash rate on Sepolia so that we hit the merge uh, at the right time. Um, and, you know, there's a, yeah, stuff like client grants or organizing like workshops. Um, so you know, anything that basically supports like the work of researchers and, and core developers in the protocol is, is stuff we, we try to help with. Um, yeah. 
I think we were get, getting toward the same point, but may have a little bit of a delay. Um, just so folks kind of get it, what does governance look like on Ethereum? How is it? How does it relate to these all core dev calls, and who decides anything? Okay, yeah, this is there's a lot to unpack here. Um, so I guess like the the very first bit uh, that's that's important to know about like Ethereum governance, especially relative to like other blockchains, is uh, we don't use like coin voting or f- any sort of formal voting as part of the governance process. Um, and the the rough reason there is that like we we don't think that like coin holders are like the only stakeholders that we should like disproportionately optimize for, um, and. And so if we don't have coin voting, you know, it becomes a much messier process uh, for, for governance to happen. Um, and there's definitely some pros and cons to that, but I think overall it's, it, it works quite well for Ethereum. And, and generally the way, the way uh, like changes to the protocol would happen, uh, you know, this is the happy path, and then we can talk about all the, the edge cases, is, uh, you know, someone comes up with an idea. We have, we have a pretty open process for like proposing changes to the protocol because all the specifications are public. Um, you know, anyone can come and, and put together like a proposal to change something. Uh, we use EIPs for that um, mostly. Again, there's some exceptions here, but like roughly we use, we use EIPs. And so if, if, if you want to change something on the protocol, you come, you put together an EIP, uh, then we usually ask that you get some feedback, you know, async from uh, people who are like, have relevant experience uh, in, in, in the part of Ethereum you're changing. Um, so imagine, you know, you're changing gas prices or something, then you'd probably reach out to some client teams. You probably want to do some benchmarking on like, why is the new gas price better? Um, if you're if you're adding something new, uh, you know, like trying to get some feedback from like the people who will use this thing that you're adding and like why is it important to them and whatnot. And once you have a proposal that's like in, in, in decent shape, we have these public calls that happen every two weeks called uh, all core devs. Um, and there's a there's a mirror version of that for for changes to the beacon chain. Um, but you know, for now you can assume they're like roughly the same thing. Um, so we have these public calls. People come with a proposal and then discuss it. And then, you know, client teams basically decide whether or not that this is a change they should implement. Um, and in practice, it's it's incredibly rare that like a change will be accepted like on the first uh, on on the first time it's presented. Depending on the complexity of the change, you know, it takes like a small number of months to like a small number of years to get that change included. Um, and most of that time is spent just like in back and forth with protocol developers who try to, to understand like, does this change actually benefit uh, people? And and most importantly, like, is there security risk to Ethereum by introducing this change? Uh, so there's a long list of changes that like would be beneficial to end users, but like there are outstanding security issues with them. And so, you know, we can't like have them in Ethereum. Then, you know, assume you, you go through this process, you convince everybody uh, on the client teams that like, okay, this change should go in. Um, client teams will, will typically then write like, uh, write the code for your change, write testings and whatnot. Um, and then they just end up putting out the software. There still needs to be like adoption of this software by the entire Ethereum community. And this is the part of Ethereum governance, which is like very different from, from a lot of projects or a lot of like other L1s where when the client devs put out the software, you can think of it as like an opinionated suggestion, right? Like they think like, okay, these are the changes we should make to Ethereum and, um, and, and this is when we should make them. But if people like stakers and, and node operators don't upgrade their nodes, those changes just like don't happen. And in practice, you know, usually by the time we've put out like a, a set of changes, the community will adopt them. And the reason is like we try to prune changes that like we think would not be adopted earlier on in the process, just because it's quite uh, messy to have an upgrade happen where, um, where, where you know, it's, it's highly contentious. And, um, and, you know, to be clear, those have happened in, in Ethereum in the past, but generally if something feels like, you know, there's not like broad community support and, and, and there's not a strong enough rationale to like include it despite that, then it's kind of in client team's best interest to not include it because then they're the ones who have to deal with like the fallout of a, of a messy network upgrade. So there is definitely like this check, you know, by like everyone involved in Ethereum about the changes that go out. And then we, you know, this often leads to like very 
intractable conversations about like what is the Ethereum community and who should get a say and whatnot. And I don't think there's like a single answer there. Um, you know, different change bring out different parts of the community with strong opinions. But yeah, it's it's, it's really this process of just like trying to come up with a set of changes that like client developers think uh, will, will be adopted and and proposing them and and in the default case uh they usually end up be, being adopted um but it's not something we can like take for granted or force upon people that's interesting i mean i i think that's the first time i i, I heard someone really kind of explain the you know the governance process for for upgrades in ethereum i, I spent a lot more time on the on the cosmos side of thing and and and, and of course there are, you know there's 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 coin voting and you know governance is is an issue i think that you know affects all different blockchains whether it's you know something like bitcoin or or ethereum with with its processes or you know blockchains with built-in uh coin voting governance do you think that coin voting governance you know could add some level of you know, useful signaling uh in ethereum governance i mean coin governance has its flaws and you know we've certainly seen that in the cosmos space recently but I think that as a, as a signaling mechanism, it's highly effective. And like we saw recently, you know, some proposals on um, on 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 um, on some Cosmos chains like get you know ninety percent or above ninety percent um, uh, buy-in. So yeah, I'm curious what your thoughts are here. Yeah, that's that's a good question. So I I don't think it adds much at the level of Ethereum L1, and and that's not to say it does. It's not useful in other contexts. But I think for us. Um, there's like two outcomes you can basically get with like your signal. Either it's like, you know, mixed or it's like strongly in favor. Um, I think for any case where it's strongly in favor, we can get that signal, you know, quite easily. Um, you know, uh, and take, you know, let's take something like EIP 1559, right? Or like the, even the merge, right? I think if you polled coin holders about the merge, they would tell you they're all in favor because it reduces issuance. Um, and I, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe some of them have like a vested interest in proof of work, so they would poll against, but like I, my rough feeling is like, you know, it, it would probably be large majority in favor. And if you take something like EIP-1559, it would probably be even clearer because like, okay, uh, coin, you know, like coins are getting burnt and that's like, you know, un, uh, undoubtedly good for coin holders. Um, but then it's like, if if we, because we don't have like a formal process to gather other signals beyond like these calls and whatnot, it, it would sort of elevate, I think, like that signal above others. Um, and it's not necessarily the thing you want to optimize for, especially in the short term, right? Like, obviously, you know, like Ether holders are like a stakeholder as part of the governance process, but they're not like the only one, um, nor are they necessarily the most aligned. Um, you know, you could argue like the client teams developing Ethereum, even though they're not like the biggest coin holders by several orders of magnitudes, like they have a desire to see like Ethereum thrive as like a long term, you know, infrastructure um, that maybe like the coin holders today don't have. Right. Like maybe, again, if you have like a very caricatural view of this, maybe like most of the coin holders today are just holding for the merge because that's a trade for them. And like, you know, they'll move on to the next thing. Um, and I'm not saying this is the case and I doubt it, it would be in practice, but it's like it's not clear to me that a signal from coin holders at a specific block um, being much more explicit than like all the other signals we have actually adds value. Um, and the, the, like the root reason there is like, yeah you're like optimizing for many stakeholders and there's obviously some alignment between coin holders and the other ones, but it's not like complete. And I think like the more your project is like aligned with coin holders, the better like those governance votes are of a signal. And if you think like, Im imagine like a very simple hypothetical DeFi product where like the coin basically gets part of like the profits from like the operation of, of that DeFi product, I think in those cases, like it's it's entirely reasonable to have the coin holders be like the main, if not sole decider of governance there, because it's like, well, they're like building this thing and this thing is like has a clear like, you know, business model or like flow funds, flow of fund structure, and they can optimize that. And 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 there's not really like you know, users are obviously maybe not coin holders, but then the users are the ones who generate your profit. So like 
you, you want to keep them happy. And this is like basically, you know, a, a pretty simple al alignment problem. And whereas for Ethereum, it's like, you know, like, yes, there's obviously like the Ether, the asset, but I think that's like a subset of what like people are trying to build and, and, and what users use it for. Um, and, the, you know, again, the, the very simplest example there, you could say like, well, you know, it's good for coin holders when like the fees are high and a lot of ETH gets burned, but that's obviously very bad for users. So you, so, so you don't want to like, yeah, over-optimize for them. Um, so yeah, and, and you know, that's said, Ethereum also has had coin votes in the past, and I'm not sure like we've gained much information from them. Um, and this is not even getting to like the technical parts of it where like a lot of the ETH is not in a, in a position where like it could vote. So for example, you know, some of it is like in a multi-sig, some of it is like wrapped in DeFi, some of it is like in cold storage. Um, so you're not even getting like a vote of like coin holders, you're getting like a weird like vote of like the ETH that's readily available and willing to like take some sort of like procedural risk to go and vote on that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm pretty against it, um, but I think, for some other projects, like where the incentive alignment is just much closer with just coin holders, that it, it makes a ton of sense. Um, we will get to the merge in just a minute. I did want to just make a, a, a one sort of point of clarification, one further question when it comes to governance, um, digging into the stakeholders that you were mentioning. So for a lot of folks listening in, it may have been a while. And some of these terms, consensus layer clients, execution layer clients, you mentioned an entire secondary call. So, you know, in the old days, all core devs was all core devs. And now you kind of have these two layers happening in unison. Um, can you explain a little bit about what this uh, client ecosystem looks like and uh, sort of your thoughts on this sort of facet of Ethereum governance and where it's headed in the years to come? Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. So, um, yeah, everything we kind of talked about, it's almost like the the, the pre-Beacon Chain Ethereum where, like, yeah, we had, um, even then, unlike other, like, blockchains, Ethereum has many implementation teams. So, like, the Ethereum protocol is specified using, like, basically math and, like, some some, like, readable but not optimized code. And then there's different teams who like implement versions of this protocol. And I think the best analogy is like web browsers in a way where like, if you go to like ethereum.org on Mozilla versus Chrome versus Firefox uh, versus Safari, um, you, you get to the same web page, but obviously like Chrome versus Safari have a bunch of different features that like they, they optimize for. Um, and so you can think of Ethereum client implementations as, as that, right? Like where there's a single specification that they follow, kind of like, you know, implementing HTTP and like uh, DNS resolving for a browser. Um, but then there's like a bunch of degrees of freedom that they have to, to, to improve their optimization, uh, stuff around sync speed, database storage, you know, the efficiency of, of API requests and whatnot. And so this means they all kind of get a say in the governance process, right? So it's not just like a single implementation team deciding this, but it's uh, basically a set of them. Um, and to make this even more complicated. In practice now, we have both like what we call the execution layer of Ethereum, which is the current proof of work chain where like smart contracts and, and, uh, and, and user balances live. Um, but now we have this beacon chain, which is the, the proof of stake uh, implementation of Ethereum. And this proof of stake beacon chain also has an independent specification and a set of independent uh, implementations for it. And that means that, like in practice, for their governance, you know, they need to come to consensus across all these teams for for changes. And now we have the merge happening, which is like the the combination of uh, the current execution chain, where we remove proof of work and instead rely on on the existing beacon chain uh, to, to to bring consensus to the network. And so this means that both from like a, a technical but also governance pr perspective, like these two layers will, will merge together, where. Uh, you know, now we have people from, say, the beacon chain giving input into decisions that affect the execution chain because, uh, you know, they're affected by it and vice versa. Um, and so this is probably like what the next couple of years of governance for Ethereum are like, is like finding, like cleanly merging those two things. Um, and I think, you know, there's some like interesting aspects to both of them that I think we want to preserve. So I think that on the execution chain, 
you know, we have like this very open process that's like fairly well documented and, and people can come into. Um, for the beacon chain, because this launched like separately from Ethereum, they wanted to optimize for speed. And so they've they've been like much better at executing efficiently. Um, and the cost there is like, you it, it's a bit harder to like, for outsiders to, to to follow the process and the specific changes, um, and I think you know as we as we merge the two together, uh, hopefully we can preserve like the, the speed that we've had from like developing these things independently and 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 having it be a bit more modular, um, but also make like the process for specifying changes across the entire Ethereum stack, uh, you know, very clear and and transparent. Um, yeah, so that's that's the big thing we'll be we'll be working on next. But in short, you'd say it's much more of a peer review process than it is sort of a participatory sort of token holder kind of thing. It's definitely participatory. Um, I peer review is a bit. It feels a bit too distanced from like what compared to what we have, right? Like peer review is usually like anonymous, and like it's also usually like one or a couple rounds, like very formal and and discrete sets of reviews. I think what we have is like much more fluid where like you, you get a bunch of reviews from your peers, um, but it's, you know, people are not anonymous or, you know, they, they can be, but like generally they're not, or at least not all of them. And, and it's also, it's not just open to experts. This is probably the other thing as well. It's like, you know, for example, take EIP 1559, which was like a, a popular one. Um, or you could take like EIP 3074, which is like another popular change that hasn't made it into Ethereum yet. It's not just client devs like reviewing and deciding about this. It's like the community and different parts of it, like smart contract developers and whatnot, will come and they'll have strong opinions, and those also need to get like incorporated. So it's it's this weird mix where like yes, there is a lot of public review, but there's also um, it's also open to like anyone to, to come in and and like in practice we get it's like we don't get every stakeholder to come in every time, but when a change affects like a set of stakeholders, like you can be sure that someone from that group will show up and have a strong opinion. Um, and this is kind of what you want, right? Like you want like the most qualified or like the person with like the strongest opinion to be heard and uh, and to make a decision based based on that, yeah. Um, so can, can you talk a little bit about the, like the testnet landscape and what that looks like and what are the current testnets um, running? Yes, so that's changed a lot recently, but um, maybe I can I can like share where we were at and, and where we're we're hoping to go. Um, but uh, Ethereum has like a lot of test nets, and um, and test nets are obviously useful for both application developers who can like deploy their contracts to them before going to mainnet, and for client developers who can deploy protocol changes to them before going to mainnet. Um, but the problem with test nets is like they they end up being very unstable over time because one, like if say they run on proof of work, like proof of work is not meant to run with like low hash rate and you get a bunch of volatility in terms of block times and whatnot. Uh, two, if they run on proof of stake, again, it's like you're asking people to like run these validators for no rewards. So it's, it's, it's quite hard to keep them stable. And then over time, you know, as just like a normal blockchain, uh, their history and their state size grows. So it becomes harder to sync a node. Um, so we've decided with the merge coming, like this was like a good time to revisit like what are our test nets and, and and what do we want them to be going forward. Um, so basically, we we launched a new test set for the merge called Kiln, and and this is like the first one we'll be shutting down uh, right after the merge. And the idea there is just we wanted something uh, earlier this year that anyone could use that was like show them what post merge Ethereum feels like. Um, so both infrastructure providers, smart contract developers and whatnot. Um, so that was like a new test net that we launched and, and its only purpose was like to um, to be there as a merge test net before we merged the other ones. And so once we've merged mainnet, that one will go away. Um, and then if you look at like the other like longer lived test nets, we basically have Gordy, Robston and Rinkeby um, as well as, as Coven. Coven has been like half deprecated for like over a year and now is like fully deprecated uh, because Open Ethereum is basically the only software that can run validators on it. And that client has been in like a semi-deprecated state for, for a year and now it's, it's, it's fully been deprecated. So if you're using Coven, basically this is not going to transition to the merge. Um, and, 
and, and so you, you should migrate to another test net because as soon as like the merge hits, the, it means that the network you're using just does not uh, does not reflect the state of, of the Ethereum network. So yeah, Rinkeby, Rinkeby is maintained by the Get team and it's been around for a long time and, and now has like a, a large state and, and a history. So it makes it harder to, to run nodes on it. Um, so we're also not transitioning this one through the merge. Um, but it has like a lot of applications depending on it uh, already. So we have a bit of a longer shutdown period where we'll probably have it be live for like about a year um, from now. Although as soon as the merge happened again, it won't be a good copy of the Ethereum mainnet. So it's most, it'll mostly be there for like legacy reasons, but in about a year should be shut down. Then we had our Robston, which was another really old test net. Um, and this one was running on proof of work. And it's always been really chaotic because getting proof of work hash rate on test nets is, is quite hard. And, and, it's, and that means like the, the average amount you get is really low. But then if somebody just shows up with a miner, uh, you know, they overwhelm the network and that causes like super quick blocks with a lot of uncles. And then when they leave, it causes super slow blocks. So it's just, it's just a bit annoying to maintain. Um, and it was always kind of been this, this chaotic state with like a lot of reorgs. And, and so we, we actually, we transitioned this one through the merge first because um, it felt like, well, you know, it's already quite chaotic. If we break it, it's probably the least bad test net to break. And now it's, it's running under proof of stake, but um, after the merge on the Ethereum mainnet, uh, we'll be shutting this one down as well. So uh, sometime before the end of the year. Um, and this leaves us two, two test nets, which we're gonna be maintaining. So the first is Gordy. Gordy is also like fairly old, but I think of the like, call them legacy test nets, it's definitely the one which has like the strongest community around it. Uh, there's like a really diverse group of, of validators on it. There's uh, a, like a lot of enthusiasts running on Gordy. And there's also like the biggest uh, beacon chain test net at uh, the Prater beacon chain that's like anchored to it. Um, so Gordy is a test net we'll be maintaining going forward. Uh, we're gonna run it through the merge. It'll be the last test net we actually run through the merge. Um, so that validators have a like dress rehearsal that they can they can try before before going on mainnet. Um, but if you're if you're using Gordy, you know it's it's not it's not going away anytime soon. And then lastly, uh, because Robston and Rinkeby were like so old and and like large, um, last fall uh, we launched a new testnet called Sepolia, and um, this actually just transitioned to proof of stake today, right before we, we recorded this. Um, and this is like a new test net where the the good thing about it is it's just like super lightweight to sync if you want to run a node on it uh you can you can get up to speed in like less than an hour um and it just makes it like really easy to maintain the downside is there's obviously not as much stuff already deployed there so there's not as much like interrupt between between contracts um but we'll be we'll be we'll be keeping this one as well and hopefully growing the amount of stuff on it over time and the, the final difference between like Gordy and Sepolia is uh, because Gordy already had a, a really like large validator testnet, um, we're going to keep this as like an open validator set. So if you just want to try stuff on your validator on the testnet, uh, you could always use Gordy. And even after the merge with Prater, like you'll still be able to do that. Um, but because again, like when people have these testnet validators, they end up like not really caring for them. It causes some amount of instability. Um, on Sepolia, instead, we've had like just a, a, a whitelisted set of, of validators where, um, where you know, th these are all like infrastructure companies and whatnot that that commit to running them for multiple years. So they're they're it's quite a stable experience for developers. So to recap all this, uh, Gordy and Sepolia are the two test nets that are like sticking around long term. This is what you should be using. You're moving to, and then the other test nets we're going to be shutting down. You should consider Coven, basically already you know very far along its deprecation window and and the shutdown soon kill the merge test net will be shut down right after the main net merge robston will be shut down before the end of this year and then uh rinkeby will probably be shut down sometime next year uh but it'll be lagging behind main net and so it won't be like a great uh, staging environment anymore okay and this leads us you know if you're a developer it's good to know if you're a user You've been probably waiting to hear, what is the merge? Uh, where do we stand now? Because um, we're talking about test nets and test net merges, and what happened today. But uh, I will just hand you the mic for a while. What's coming up? Yeah, and 
again, I think this is it's useful to give a bit of context on like like how did we get to like where we are today and then like what are the next couple steps. Um, but basically, we've been testing the merge for over a year now. And if you count the launch of the beacon chain, it's like more like two and a half or so years. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, we launched this beacon chain separately from the Ethereum like application proof of work chain because at the time there's already a ton of usage on Ethereum and we wanted to make sure that like the beacon chain worked and was was stable and that if it wasn't, it wouldn't break everything else on Ethereum. So we, we launched it and and after it had been up and running for a while, you know, we started to to the prototype, like, okay, how are we gonna actually combine these two networks together? And like really early designs for this had like a migration as part of them where like users would have to move from one to the other. Um, and that just felt like really bad user experience uh, where ideally you don't want them to uh, to have to do that. Um, and there was this insight in, uh, yeah, a, a few years ago that, well, the clients that run Ethereum, uh, the proof of work chain today, they're already used to, to this concept of like different consensus algorithms. Um, so like we mentioned, you know, mainnet, mainnet uses, uh, uses proof of work, but a lot of the test nets don't, right? They use uh, what we call proof of authority or just different consensus engines. And similarly, like a lot of enterprise private networks also use like different consensus engines. And so there was a, this idea of like, well, what if instead of moving all the applications over from like the proof of work chain to the beacon chain, we simply had like the software that's running all the applications change what consensus algorithm it listens to uh, to get like to get the consensus on, on the state of, of the network. Um, and this is like the, the very high level design of the merge is that once we hit a certain point, the clients on the network stop listening to proof of work as a way to get the latest valid head for the, for the blockchain. And they start listening to the proof of stake beacon chain. Um, and this means that you don't need to move all the applications over from one to the other. You can simply kind of use a different rule to tell you what was the latest valid block and keep kind of building on, on the existing, existing chain. Um, so we first prototyped that in May of, of last year. Uh, there was like a hackathon and um, we got some of the client teams together to prototype like, could the post-merge uh, architecture work where you have a beacon chain client that kind of keeps track of the head and then they receive blocks and they send them down to their execution client, which runs the EVM transactions, make sure that those transactions are valid and then like confirms that or, or orphans the block if not. So we, we prototyped that uh, in this hackathon, uh, we got it to work. So that was like good confirmation that like this design was sound, you know, like with the, with, with the two clients talking to each other. Obviously, it, it was a hackathon, so there were a ton of bugs. Uh, so we spent like last summer fixing all those bugs and and, and ironing out a design uh, for for like a, a final architecture. And then um, last fall, we prototyped the actual transition from like proof of work to proof of stake. So um, could you like start a network up on proof of work, start a beacon chain separately, and have them transition and you know not fall apart throughout and and safely like finalize on the other side. So we got everyone in person actually for this for a week. And uh, after like a week of work, we managed to get like a first prototype of that working where uh, we, we launched a DevNet and it started on proof of work, moved over to proof of stake and it finalized on the other side. Um, and so again, this was just like a, a week long hackathon. So there were tons of bugs and issues. And we spent like all of the fall after that fixing those. And by uh, basically the Christmas holidays, we had a spec for like the entire merge and post-merge Ethereum, which we felt was like pretty stable, like not perfect, but you know, roughly right. So we launched this first uh, test net called Kintsugi um, right uh, like late December. And this was just to like give people an idea of like what post-merge Ethereum would look like for us to reach out to infrastructure providers and application developers to make sure that like, you know, Things didn't break uh, when they were using it, and 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 we got that confirmation. Uh, we also ran a bunch of stress tests on the network, like spammed it and 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 put nodes in weird states. And we found doing that, we found some some edge cases in this in the spec, so we we fixed all of those. And in March, uh, we launched this killed test net, which I mentioned earlier, uh, which which was basically like call it like 95% final spec uh, for the merge. So we've done some small tweaks to this spec since then, but no like big substantive changes. Um, 
they've mostly been either like clarifications or just, you know, some edge cases that like a subset of clients were hitting and whatnot. Um, but like the overall like functionality has, has stayed the same since then. And after, after launching Kiln, um, we still felt like um, it would be good to get like some more practice runs because you learn a lot like when the network runs through the merge. And it's, it's a bit weird in a way because this is code that only has to run once on mainnet. Um, and there's like a ton of complexity there. But then once the merges happen, you know, you never need to run through the transition again. So we, we wanted to make sure we got like as many kind of runs of that as possible. And we started doing these things called shadow forks, which are basically hard forks where we only launch a small number of nodes controlled by like client and testing teams, which, which have the hard fork. Um, and then we see how it goes for them. So you can think of this like, you know, there's like thousands of nodes on like the Ethereum network. Well, we take like 10 to 100, we spin them up and we tell those like small number of nodes, like, hey, the merge is happening here. And then we, we actually run through the merge on those nodes and see what happens. And, um, and for a couple of days, also we can replay transactions from mainnet as well. So we, we get to see not only like running through the merge on mainnet, but also are the nodes stable afterwards? You know, can you still sync and whatnot? Um, so we've been doing these shadow forks over and over. I think we had like our 11th or 12th one uh, earlier this week. So basically like every week since since like late March, if not multiple times a week sometimes. Um, and that's been really good to, to, to help us test like not only every client implementation, but also every pairwise combination. So earlier we mentioned, you know, there's like, these clients that work on the execution chain, these clients that work on the beacon chain, um, there's four on one side, five on the other. This means there's like 20 pairwise combinations of like one beacon chain and one execution client that you can get. And so in these shadow forks, we basically test every single possible permutation and we wanna make sure that they all work. And then we find, you know, when we find bugs, uh, we, we obviously fix them. And this is roughly like where, where we were like a, a month or two ago. Um, and now we've, you know, we feel like much more confident in like the the the, the readiness of, of 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 the code. We're not like a hundred percent there yet, but um, you know, we felt ready enough that it made sense to start forking the like long lived test nets on Ethereum. Um, and there were a couple of reasons for that. The first is like uh, with Robston, we mentioned earlier, like it's quite a chaotic test nets al already. So it was um, even if like something went wrong, it, it wasn't the end of the world. Um, but we also wanted to give end users, like people running validators at home, the chance to run through like a, a merge basically, because all these shadow forks, uh, the nodes are basically controlled by client teams and testing teams, but it's not open to, to anyone to run a node. So we had this first Robston fork where we had, we had like a new beacon chain launch for Robston and anyone could, um, could join that. And yeah, on, on that, uh, you know, we, we had people participate and, and the network moved over and uh, generally the transition went well. Um, so that was good. We found some couple bugs that, that we then fixed. Um, and then today we ran through the second test net, Sepolia. And the goal there was to, to make sure that like the bugs, uh, you know, the bugs on Robson wouldn't show up again. And we're still, we're, it generally looks like the fork went well, but we're still digging into the details and, and, and calming through everything. Once we have that, we basically have one more test net to do before mainnet. And this is Gorly with the Predator Beacon chain. And this is a test net where, you know, we really want things to be quite ready um, because this is where the majority of stakers are like expected to like run through the transition um, with their setup in, in anticipation of mainnet. And it has a ton of activity as well. So it's not a test net we want to, to, to break. Um, so once, you know, we, once we've like debriefed on, on this Sepolia fork and, and see whether there's any issues we need to fix or address, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start scheduling Gordy. And then once Gordy happens, um, assuming it goes well, then we would look at scheduling, uh, the fork for, for mainnet. Um, and the goal is really just to get as many like dry runs as we can in increasingly complex scenarios where, um, if you start super complex from the side, from the start, you're going to hit a bunch of issues and it's going to be really hard to find a root cause. But if you start with like these small dev nets that you like increase complexity over and over, you're always like fixing bugs at like the edge of like the complexity. And it, it just makes it much harder to, uh, uh, much easier, sorry, to fix those bugs if you're, if you're increasing complexity as you go. Um, but yeah, in short, it's like, yeah, we spent the past year testing. We've done one more test net today. There's one left and uh, assuming things go well, go well on that one, we'd, we'd move to mainnet. 
So to recap, uh, dev, merge specific devnets, long-standing merge specific testnets in line with these shadow forks, upgrade the long-standing Ethereum testnets that we covered earlier, and then mainnet with one more long-standing testnet left to go, and that's Gurley. That's correct, yeah. And then Gordy with the Prater Beacon chain, and we'll, we'll just call it all Gordy after it's merged. So what do you look for in a successful merge? And when it's done, what's next? So I know that a lot of work has been done on Shanghai, and a lot of those listening would probably be curious about. So there's some misconceptions about the merge that I'm sure you're probably very familiar with and can speak to, um, from token unlocks to scalability. Um, and some of those things are, are uh, covered in uh, the next sort of set of upgrades that come after. So what's left coming up until the merge and, and what comes next? Coming up until the merge is basically we want to monitor these test nets, like not only right after, but also like, you know, call it a week after so that we can still sync nodes to them and things work uh work well and you know we have a whole slew of metrics that we look at like from some pretty basic stuff like our blocks being produced to like you know our like transaction fees for every transaction being routed to the right way so it's you know now it's really just combing through all these metrics and, and making sure that like things are looking good and, and fixing anything where, where it isn't um, and then when we fix things you know if we find a bug we'll typically then write a test for it and then run all the clients through through this test suite because it's possible that it's just like, you know, one client hit something during during a, a merge, but then all of the clients actually had the bug and it just happened not to hit it. Um, so now it's like, yeah, it's really like fine calming through that. Um, and then if, you know, if, if you look out and you assume the merge has happened and, and we're all good, yeah, there's, there's a, obviously more things on the Ethereum roadmap beyond that. Um, and, and maybe the first uh, that, that you hinted at is this idea of like beacon chain withdrawals. Um, so because the merge is like the most complicated upgrade we've done to Ethereum since probably launching Ethereum, um, we've tried to cut down anything that wasn't absolutely critical from it, just so we can have like the smallest possible set of changes, uh, which is already a pretty big set of changes. Um, and and, and the, the, the biggest like cut to that is the ability for validators to withdraw their stakes back to uh, to the execution layer, so to like fully exit as a validator. Um, so that's like the first big feature we're, we're planning uh, for after the merge. Uh, typically, when we have these hard forks with with new features, we'll we'll introduce more than one. So there's a bunch of other proposals as well. Um, but that's the stuff we'll be we'll be working on right after. One thing I'll note though, with regards to validators and, and withdrawals, is while validators won't be able to withdraw like their their stakes after the merge, like the 32 ETH plus like the rewards they've accrued. Um, as soon as the merge happens, validators will receive transaction fees that currently go to miners, and they'll be receiving that on the execution layer itself. So they won't um, they, they won't be locked like validators are on the beacon chain. Uh, so this is kind of neat. So if you are a staker um, or even like using a staking pool or something, you will start accruing uh, the, the non-burnt part of transaction fees um, right after the merge. Yeah. So let's talk about what happened uh, just, just a couple of minutes ago, about an hour ago, uh, the, the Sepolia merge. Um, can, you, can you talk about that in, in the context of like sort of every, you know, this, this broader roadmap and how significant it is to um, you know, the broader like merge uh, efforts? Yeah, yeah. So, so like we, we were saying, it's like the second out of three test nets. Um, and it is like this new one, which we hope to keep stable. Um, and the, the validators on this network are like a set of, you know, client teams, testing teams, infrastructure providers. So it's not, it's not like quite anyone. Like we, because we want, uh, we want this network to be stable, we, we basically open it to like any individual or entity that can commit to running stable validators over a long period of time. Um, but there's not just like a web page where you can sign up and, 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 and launch a validator like there is for Prater. Um, so this was like a good test because it's like it shows us okay like there is still like some group of 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 like distinct entities and and individuals that need to coordinate and uh, and debug things um but it's still not as open as like the the Prater beacon chain or mainnet um 
so yeah, it's it's like it increases like the, the complexity of things. Um, I you know because we're on this 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 call, I haven't like been digging through uh, all the uh, the specific things that that happened, but at a high level. Uh, right before I jumped on, it seemed like you know the the network was was relatively stable. There were some parts of validators that hit like some some issues that were offline, and and it seems like folks are still looking into that. But we'll know better in like the next couple of days, like you know what types of bugs did we hit? Were they were they bugs or were they actually just like configuration issues? Um, so if they're configuration issues, this is actually quite good because it's like you know call it like operator error rather than uh, than like protocol problems. So that's you know you can just restart the validators uh, the wrong with the right configs and it works. Um, so that's what we're looking at. I think once we have a clear picture there, uh, we'll start thinking about okay, when do we want to fork this last test net? Uh, I think our bar for the last test net will be higher because we want to make sure that like any staker can run through it and that it's like as close to mainnet as as uh, as possible. Um, and then yeah, assuming that goes well, then we would we would then move to to, to merge mainnet. And so this next test net, anybody, anybody would be able to run a, a validator on this, on this, on the next test net. Yeah, 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 and, and you can already, right? Like, so you don't need to wait for the merge. You can literally go and like register a validator on Prater and and have it be up and ready for the merge. Um, and if 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 you want to also run a post merge validator right now, you can do so on Robston. So Robston has merged, and so you won't run through the actual transition. But if you want to figure out, okay, how do I configure my validator so that like I actually get transaction fees and like, uh, and some validators, for example, today it is possible to use a third party provider instead of running an execution layer node to track deposits. Um, after the merge, it won't be possible to do so. So if you've been using, say, Infra or Alchemy with your Beacon Chain clients to track deposits, you can't do that after the merge. So you need to figure out, okay, how do I run, you know, Baseu, Nethermine, Geth, Aragon? Um, and you can do all that on Robston today um, and register a validator and make sure that it's it's working. Um, yeah. Cool. So uh, as we wrap up here, I, I think it, it, it would be interesting to maybe talk a little bit about about scaling and you know how um, like how post merge uh, what, what scaling will look look like post merge and uh, you know I, I think it's interesting that you know ethereum is is taking this data availability approach and allowing um, sort of like ecosystem chains to build on top of this on this on top of this base layer um, what what is what is your view about like what this ecosystem will look like post merge? You know, wh where will like the majority of applications live? And and I think one interesting one interesting thing maybe also to consider is how what are some of the interoperability? Uh, um, I mean, beyond beyond like bridging and things like that. Like, what is the word the the work being done on operability to ensure that all of these different uh, roll-ups and like chains built on top of the data availability layer uh, will be able to um, talk to each other and like do cross-chain calls and stuff like that. I think, you know, over time in terms of just like designing Ethereum, there's been this, this like evolution where it's like, if you compare Ethereum when, when it launched to Bitcoin, it was like this maximally complex blockchain relative to Bitcoin, right? Where, uh, you know, uh, it, it concerns itself with like arbitrary computation and state and whatnot. Um, well, I think obviously the, the blockchain landscape has evolved a ton since then. And and like the, the kind of design philosophy in a way for Ethereum has, has kind of shifted to like, okay, what is the actual minimal set of things we can provide with the highest level of security, which then enable people to build, uh, you know, applications, scaling solutions, and whatnot that, that depend on that. And so, you know, like one very obvious shift is I decided that Ethereum originally wanted to do something called execution sharding, where there's a bunch of like L1 shards, which each process computation in parallel that are like managed by the protocol. And we've moved to this world where, well, instead, we'd rather allow like a free market of like solutions to, to emerge and, and use Ethereum uh, as, as like more of a settlement layer. And this is what we've seen with, with L2s today. Um, and this is how, you know, we think about like scaling is, 
the L1 chain, like, I mean, the capacity will keep improving and there's some stuff we can do, but like, it, it will not improve as quickly as like the demand for block space grows. Um, you know, so if you imagine we improve the capacity like 10x or 100x over the next like five, 10 years, demand for blockchain might grow like 100,000x, right? Like we need like several order of magnitude more. And this is where things like basically layer twos um, can provide that. And so, and, and, and the way layer twos work like at a very high level is that they trade off this, this asymmetry where on Ethereum, it's like very expensive to run computation, but fairly cheap to store data. Um, Whereas on an L2, it's actually quite cheap to run computations. So if you can run all your computations on L2 and post like some data about them back to L1, that allows you to like lower your fees a ton because you're just running all these computations and uh, not actually running much on Ethereum L1. And ZK rollups and optimistic rollups differ in how like they, they approach this. But at a high level, it's like there's this asymmetry between the cost of like running operations versus posting data. Um, and, and so if we could get scaling solutions that just run most computations off chain, either like run like some proofs on chain or some, some disputes on chain, but then mostly post data, uh, that allows like for way cheaper transaction fees and for, for more scale. And so um, today when these, these rollups and scaling solutions post data back to Ethereum, the only mechanism they have to do so is like storing data in the blockchain forever. And, and this has like two two consequences. One is like every single node on the chain needs to process that data. And two, they need to hold on to it basically forever. Um, and so that means that like it's it's still fairly expensive to store data on, on Ethereum. Um, and, and so when you pay for like a transaction on, on a layer two, most of the cost you're actually paying is to store this data back on Ethereum. The first thing we can do there is like, okay, well, how do we make it cheaper to store data on, on, on Ethereum? Because that'll then mean it's like cheaper for all these rollups to, to be built and, and or conversely that they can like accommodate more demand for the same price and, and therefore scale. Um, and one thing about rollups is they don't actually need this data to be stored forever on the network. They only need it to be posted on the network and available for like some amount of time such that people can like agree that it was there and that it was correct. And if, if it is not correct, have like a reasonable amount of time to dispute it. Um, and typically this is on the order of like a week, more or less. Um, so there's this like assumption within rollups that like if the data has been made available for roughly a week, it gives time for people to like sanity check it, make sure that there's no like uh, either malicious or, or buggy transactions or, or, or like mismatch between what the L2 thinks is the state of the world and what L1 thinks uh, the L2 state of the world is. Um, and, and if that happens, then it's fine. And so this is really the window where like you want to provide like really strong security guarantees around this data in this short period of time. And, and after that, you almost like don't really need to provide much because you can assume that well, if there was a dispute, um, it, it would have been resolved. And, and uh, if somebody wanted to make a copy of the data, then they could have done so already. Um, and so this is where we get into like this idea of data availability, which is to say like, what if instead of just having these L2s store data on the blockchain forever, they simply post it to another place where uh, it's still secured by Ethereum, but we don't guarantee this data is available forever. We guarantee it's available roughly like for how long rollups need it um, with some buffer, you know, on each side. So like I was saying, you know, rollups usually need this data for the order of like a week. And like the proposals for Ethereum right now is like, what if we just provided a way to make data available for like the order of like a month or something? So it's like, you know, even if it's, even if you need it within a week, yeah, like maybe you need to sync a node. Literally, you know, you need to go buy a computer, get an internet connection set up, get the guy come to your house, set it up, sync your node. And, and you know, this extra buffer would give you enough time that like you, you could still recuperate the data that way. And so this is when we talk about like proto dank sharding, this is roughly the idea is what if we added like just a data component on Ethereum, which is like ephemeral, but still highly secure, but then you can charge less uh, for this data component because um, you're not you're not basically incurring a, a forever storage cost. You're incurring like a short duration storage cost. And then the next level beyond that is 
what if instead of having all the nodes on the network incur this like short-term storage costs, you could scale the amount of data that you're storing, have nodes only store a subset of it, but then get like a really high probabilistic guarantee that the rest of the data is available on the network. And this is like when we talk about like full sharding for Ethereum or like bank sharding, which is like the latest spec for it. This is what it means is we take this, this infrastructure that we have to store like a, an ephemeral amount of, of data. Um, but instead of having every node store a full copy of all the data, you have every node store a subset of it and do some like cryptographic checks uh, across the peer-to-peer -peer network to ensure that um, other nodes are storing the rest of the data with like a really, really high probability, right? Like think, you know, there's like, I, I don't know if it's like in the billions or trillions, but like there's an incredibly low chance that like some amount of data would be, would be unavailable on the network. And because basically by doing that, you're able to scale roughly by another, another order of magnitude, the amount of data that, that you have. Um, and then those, those cost savings are, are like basically scaling uh, bandwidth gets passed on for, for layer twos and other solutions that, to help. Um, and so this is like roughly the, the vision. It's just like, can we hone in on the parts where security matter the most and like put all of our efforts there um, and provide like these incredibly high like security assurances that this data, you know, was made available, that this data was like correct and that the network came to consensus on it. Um, but then after that kind of outsource to like the community and to the ecosystem, like ways to store, manage that data. And, you know, your other point was around like, like cross, uh, you know, L2 communications and stuff like that. I think, again, that's something where it feels like the L1 protocol itself is not the place for, for that to live, but where it's, it's probably much healthier if you see just like a, a market emerge and the best solutions, you know, gain traction there. Okay, so to recap slightly, um, the merge is happening, and then after the merge happens, it, we would dig into things that look like uh, optimizations that help with scaling in L2 land. But I think, you know, as, as we come close to closing, I could give you the mic back to talk a little bit about where I think some folks maybe fell off the wagon a little bit, is that as research changes, um, titles change, naming schemes change, um, and roadmaps change. So for those that have maybe been on the epicenter train for closer to a decade, um, there are four stages to Ethereum's roadmap, right? There's Frontier, Homestead, Metropolis, and Serenity, and that's long gone. And for those that um, sort of came around during the ICO era, uh, the question is, when is two? Um, which still kind of exists today in a couple of different places and people that confuse one another with uh, uh, supposed uh, token name changes that don't exist, but this revolved around some phases. So would you say this is kind of where the roadmap stands now? It's A, merge, B, these kind of optimizations and whatever else into the future. Um, what is today's, uh, is this sort of today's Ethereum roadmap? I guess the, the kind of meta part from your, your, your question is like, Clearly, the Ethereum roadmap has changed a lot, so it's um, it's probably naive to expect you know today is when it, it gets set in stone. Um, I think maybe like the biggest like conceptual change is we're a bit less like linear now than than we were before, and we, because we've grown the amount of people who contribute to the protocol, we're able to do stuff in parallel to a degree that like we we couldn't, and um, and so this means like when you know, like if, if you looked at like, you know, this like frontier, the serenity roadmap or like each two phase zero, phase one, phase two, they all assume like, you know, it's like we're going to work on A, then we're going to work on B, then we're going to work on C. Whereas today, it, I think we're in a spot where like, obviously we need to ship things one after the other. We can't ship every single thing at the same time, but there's definitely different teams and different like, even within teams, like people that are working on like the various, you know, big either issues with Ethereum or like areas of improvement. And they're, they're kind of happening in parallel. So like we talked about like, we talked about beacon chain withdrawals. 
Uh, we talked about sharding. We talked, you know, we didn't talk about like MEV and proposer builder separation, and we didn't talk about like statelessness, uh, and we didn't talk about like the EVM and continuing to improve that. But those are all like threads that are happening in parallel today. Um, and I think at you know at a high level, it's like there's some protocol related things that we need to do to ensure that Ethereum like scales and is safe and like um, and that we we don't end up in like a, a spot where it, there's there's like some centralized actor within the system who can like exert a, a really high level of, of control and, and of influence. Um, and there's a ton of work that's being done on, on those fronts. Um, but then, yeah, there's also a ton of work that's being done on like making sure the EVM stays like relevant and, and keeps improving. Um, and luckily it's like, they're not blocked on one, one on the other. And what, what I think like happens is then, you know, whenever something goes to, from the spot where it's like ready to go from research to production, then we we typically will, will prioritize that and and um and, and get working on it at the at the client level. Um and we've been lucky so far that like it's just not happened that like two R and D efforts are like ready to ship at the same time. And if they are in the future, which it probably will happen, then we'd have to decide which one is, is higher priority or do we want to bundle them together. But yeah, I, I think it's yeah, there's not as much like a single big roadmap. And and that's one thing we've tried to do like with the naming, you know, you talked about like E2 versus E1, and today we call them like the consensus layer versus like execution layer. And I think the best naming strategy like going forward is just to try and like describe things like very like plainly, like what they are. Like, you know, the consensus layer like helps the Ethereum network come to consensus on the valid uh, tip of the chain. The execution layer actually runs those transactions. I think once we have like sharding live, you know, it would be fair to call that like a data layer or like a data availability layer. And, and similarly, if you look, you know, on the MEV land, when they start to think about like proposer builder separation, it's like they're taking this one step further when they're looking at like, okay, what's the role of a validator? What are the different tasks that like a validator can do? What are the degrees of freedom? And can we just like, you know, segment that in, in, in even more granular detail so that we can we can analyze it better? So that's my hope. Like, I think if we if we can go from like having this like very vague like. Yeah, terms to just saying like, okay, these are like the five biggest problems and we need to, to address them. And, and this is like the solution bit that's going to address them. Um, I'll be really happy. Obviously, it's not, it's not my call to make, but uh, I've, I've appreciated that we're, we're trending in that direction. And I think we're going to have to save proposer builder separation for the second round. Yeah, you need, you need someone else to come and, and give a, a two hour talk on that. Yeah. Yeah, the next the next time we have someone from uh, from EF on, it'll be to answer the question when E three. <laughs> <laughs> we should uh, you know we need we need we need to start getting some content out like early about about E three you know um, since since uh, you know since, since since our history with you know covering this sort of topic on Epicenter. Um but yeah thanks uh, thanks for coming on Tim it's been great and uh, I, you know ho hopefully now our listeners um, get a much better view of. You know the overall arch of you know the merge and everything that's um, that's coming up uh, next. Certainly, I, I have a much better understanding now. So uh, hopefully, we can get you on again soon and uh, in a couple of months uh, when uh, when things um, start to move into production. Awesome! Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Great, thanks.